Hey everyone, Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. Today, I am talking about MTHFR and depression. Uh, MTHFR stands for methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. It's an enzyme critically involved in converting inactive folic acid from your diet to active folic acid. And it can have profound impacts on mental health. I'm attempting now, I know you, I've talked about my attempts before, but I'm really attempting to do a video a week on a neurological condition, particularly gonna focus on mental health here for the next month or two. Um, my observation, the people I'm talking to, it seems that there's a lot of heaviness about two years into the pandemic. Uh, a lot of my contacts, patients seem to be dealing with that. I know of so many uh, individuals who've lost loved ones through this pandemic. So it's been a really tough time. And I think it's good that we kind of have a refresher on mental health. I did a depression series, um, gosh, almost upwards of two years ago. So it's kind of time to circle the wagons back around. Maybe you'll come away with some tools. We're gonna to be doing some things in office here uh, to kind of help patients de-stress. So, and we'll try to bring everybody in on Facebook Lives for that. Anyways, um, with that preamble, go ahead and pause the video right now. Basically, this is not intended as medical advice. Go ahead and read that. And, um, and that's where we'll go. Okay, so we're gonna show this one. Let me scroll over, scroll back. We're going to hide that one. Okay. Good, good, good. So MTHFR polymorphisms linked to depression. That is the title of the talk. We're going to hide that, show this in the stream. So as I mentioned, the MTHFR enzyme converts folic acid into active folic acid. It seems really benign and simple. Ironically, it's super duper important. There's a medical term for you. It's really, really important, particularly for mental health and detoxification. There are two different types of MTHFR enzymes, namely that are commonly referenced, the C677 and the 1298C. Individuals who have abnormalities, you can think of it that, um, genetic polymorphisms involving C677, it seems to have greater impact on mental health, 1298C seems to impact more detoxification. However, if you have one abnormal copy of the C677 and the 1298C, that can also be bad systemically and for mental health. So we're gonna talk about how this inability to convert folic acid from your diet to active folic acid can have profound impacts on the level of neurotransmitters in the brain. Uh, may be associated with psychiatric disorders such as schizophrenia, bipolar, and depression. Even there's studies linking to autism. And uh, studies have found a correlation between MTHFR and depression. And, um, and yeah, so that pretty well summarizes it. Are there studies that are contrary to this? Yes. So someone said to me, I think it was last week, where they said, you know, show me a study and I'll show you another study that opposes that. And that's really true. So you have to look at the totality of the data and you have to look at maybe the data that pertains to the clinical situation you're working with. And I'm going to cite some of that as we go through. All right, we're going to... Okay, I think we went through that. Okay. Bullet... Uh, deficiency folate is found in foods such as green leafy veggies, liver, asparagus, Brussels sprouts. Um, I think we've covered all this. Homocysteine metabolism is really important. So that's a blood test you can talk to your doctor about uh, if you think you have an MTHFR polymorphism, but it doesn't always show up um, if you have an MTHFR abnormality. So just be aware of that. Okay. And then I'm going to show this in stream and we'll hide that one and we'll hide that one. Okay, this is where I'm going to pull out the brain. And I think it's really, really important that we just kind of have an, this is always so backwards, an overarching understanding of the physiology of depression. Depression is different from other uh, conditions like anxiety in that there's a lot of hardwired biological issues going on in the brain of someone who's depressed. Namely, what science has found. Here's your frontal lobe. Okay, so there's your frontal lobe up here. We turn the brain and we're going deep 
into the temporal lobe right in here. Deep in the temporal lobe is where your fear center and your memory area are located. The fear center, kind of think of it as an almond that sits in front of something that looks like the tail of, I don't know, like a slug, something like that. That's kind of what the hippocampus looks like. It loops around and then the fear center sits in front of it. And so often, probably because of a variety of mechanisms, in depression, the fear center becomes bigger. It causes activation of the front part of your brain hormonally down to your adrenal glands to lead to lots of high sustained cortisol levels that then lead to neurons in your memory area getting fried. Um, they actually atrophy. And so what, that's what we see in volumetric MRI studies is that this memory area shrinks, the fear center actually tends to enlarge when you compare them to age match normals. And we now know that antidepressants, we used to think they, you know, boost chemicals in the brain. You have a chemical problem if you have depression. Not really true. The chemical problem causes a neuronal growth problem. So it seems that when people take antidepressants, it can take a couple weeks to work. This is for monopolar depression, not bipolar disorder, but we're just talking about more standard depression. And in essence, the antidepressants help to facilitate growth of neurons in your memory area, again, way deep down in the temporal lobe, to then oppose the fear center. And actually, it tends to shut off the fear center from firing so much. So the cortisol goes down, and then an individual's brain has a chance to heal. There are so many facets to this that I'm going to try and go through in separate disparate videos, uh, more separate videos, so we can kind of bring it all together with a contemporary understanding particularly in light of all the stress that many people have been through these last few years on top of just the other life stress that everybody was dealing with. So let me know uh, your questions on that, uh, if that made sense, if it didn't make sense. Okay, so moving on. Here we go. This is just gonna look like a, a bunch of writing to you, but if you wanna pause the video and look at a, a few key things, I think that would be good uh, once I'm done talking about this. This uh, article is from Translational Psychiatry, I believe published in 2018. Here's the link, the author's information. The MTHFR enzyme is critically important in converting 5,10-methylene tetrahydrofolate into 5-methyl-tetrahydrofolate. You have to have 5-methyl-tetrahydrofolate to convert homocysteine that I mentioned before into methionine. You have to have methionine to create this thing called s methionine. You may have heard of SAMe, and that's critically important in the epigenetic modulation of a number of DNA synthesis pathways. Also, this is super important for brain inflammation. I'm going to show this one. And now this one may resonate more with you. What we know is that when individuals have polymorphisms of MTHFR, something called tetrahydrobiopterin goes down. And simply just think that dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin synthesis go down. So simply, if you have this MTHFR polymorphism, your ability to produce dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin are reduced. And if that's reduced, that's going on all the time that you're going through life. And maybe life is copacetic. Maybe life is wonderful. Maybe life is super stressful. Maybe you don't think your life is here in the beginning of 2022 where you thought it would be. That's actually incredibly distressing for us psychologically. Uh, I think Elon Musk said on a, a podcast, happiness is reality without expectations. The expectations just to go off on a little tangent, create a disparate firing in your anterior cingulate gyrus, and it actually facilitates activation of this little area down here below your corpus callosum that then activates the sad part of your brain and leads to depression. So expectations can be a really hard thing for our brain. Needless to say, if your serotonin and dopamine are not being produced at the right levels, it may make you more vulnerable for something like what we call monopolar depression, just depression. And what is depression? Depression clinically is not just feeling sad for a few days. If 
you know, if you've had a loved one die, an animal die, and you're depressed for a couple, you know, 10 days or something like that, that's not true clinical depression. True clinical depression is where it's an ongoing problem. I believe it has to have been there for at least two weeks, but it's, it's a long-term issue. You can think of it that way. It's not getting better. It's associated with eating more, eating less, gaining weight, losing weight, associated with easy crying, associated with thoughts of, you know, hopelessness, um, a lack of pleasure in hobbies and activities, disturbed sleep, and sometimes thoughts of self-harm. That's clinical depression. And probably a lot of people have been kind of doing this, and I'm seeing more and more individuals who are then on the down, downward decline in terms of mood uh, a couple of years into this pandemic, more than I've ever seen before. So hopefully you can take away from that that we have decreased serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, and those chemicals, think of them because I said the memory area, which is kind of like the, the tail of a slug, I need a better example, but literally your fear center is here and then the memory area is looping in behind it. And this memory area is one of two areas in your brain that makes new brain cells all the time. And if you're not making new brain cells there because you can't make enough serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine, then that can make you more vulnerable theoretically for stressors in life to then maybe lead to uh, depression, maybe lead to recurrences of depression. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. And then this is where I'm going to pause. I'm actually going to, I don't usually do this. I'm going to, I took some pictures of an article or some screenshots. Uh, if you want to read this article, Google, it's called the interaction between the MTHFR C677T polymorphism and traumatic childhood events predicts depression. Uh, lead author, last name is L-O-K, first initial A, A lock. It's in the Journal of Translational Psychiatry. Now get this. So they studied two components in the study. They looked at MTHFR status and if an individual had traumatic childhood events. Why are traumatic childhood events important? Because the brain when it's developing uh, is taking so many things in. And if that individual is exposed to bad circumstances then that fear center is gonna be much more active and actually dominant and actually can be bigger than someone who's grown up in you know, the most wonderful environment. Um, so they looked at, do you have a history of, or do individuals have a history of traumatic childhood events? And then what is the MTHFR status? They followed these individuals for five and a half years. So it's not just a temporary study, they followed them for a long time. And they found that medium time, and these were individuals who had depression. So they're looking at recurrence of depression. Does depression come back? <clears throat> it was 191 days. For those who did not have an MTHFR polymorphism and who experienced, um, let me say it this way. So if they didn't have a traumatic childhood event and they didn't have an MTHFR polymorphism is 191 days. It was 461 days if they had traumatic childhood events, but their MTHFR was normal. So 191 days if everything was good, no MTHFR issue. 461 days if they had traumatic childhood events, but, oh, excuse me, I, I, I mixed that up, forgive me. Okay, we're gonna go back. So it was a time for reoccurrence was 191 days if they had traumatic childhood events and they had the MTHFR polymorphism. It was 461 days if they had a normal MTHFR, but they had traumatic childhood events. It was 773 days if they had an MTHFR polymorphism, but they didn't have traumatic childhood events. And it was 866 days if they had a normal MTHFR and they had a normal childhood. So you can see the time for reoccurrence was 191 days versus 866 days if they had an MTHFR issue. The reoccurrence time was 191 days. Hopefully that made sense. Sorry, I butchered, butchered that at the beginning. Point being is that if you have this MTHFR and you've been through a lot of stress, you're more likely to have recurrent depression. That's the point. So that's really, really, really important. Uh, in terms of the questions, we said so many need uh, what to use instead of SSRIs. 
uh, and hi to everyone who's joining. Uh, that's kind of where my line of work comes in. So that's where I use methyl tetrahydrofolate. Again, none of this is intended as medical advice. Um, but what I would say is that the amount of that methyl tetrahydrofolate can be really important. And you have to take in all these other factors as to why someone is depressed because no two individuals are the same. Some people are depressed because their hormones are low. Some people are depressed because they're eating gluten. Some people are depressed for eight different reasons. And all that has to be ascertained. And that's really what's recommended in the medical literature because the world leading cause of disability is depression, according to the WHO. World leading cause of disability, not back pain, not some other condition, not osteoarthritis, it's depression and people not responding to depression. So yes, medications work wonderfully on a lot of individuals. Psychiatrists are fantastic. And there still is a lot of people out there and some estimates are it's around 50% of people are treatment resistant in terms of their depression. So that's where it's so important to look at these deeper root causes such as MTHFR and just in the study that I cited you for individuals who had a lot of stress in childhood and they have an MTHFR polymorphism their time to reoccurrence is 191 days whereas those who have had a good childhood and don't have an MTHFR polymorphism their time to reoccurrence is 866 days. So one is less than a year and one is around three years, two to three years. So that's really, 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 really important. Um, let me see, what can us people going through anxiety and depression actually help? Um, what can us people going through anxiety and depression actually help? That's where hopefully this information will lead you to explore new topics, talk to your doctor about new topics if you're having depression. I think all of us taking a baseline assessment saying, Am I depressed a couple of years into this pandemic is really, really important and pursue active treatment and kind of use this information as a tool to talk to your doctor about, of course, this is what I do in helping individuals. So you can, if you want to contact me, you can, that's not being pushy. I'm just saying, this is what I do, but talk to healthcare professionals about this. And hopefully the more we talk about this, the more traction it will gain for helping not only yourself, but maybe other people too, uh, because I think a lot of people are struggling. So send me any other comments or feedback you have. I have to get to work. And so nice to talk with all of you this Tuesday morning. Okay, bye-bye.